All right, guys. Um, in the spirit of a proper Texan welcome, uh, howdy, y'all. Um, <laughs> we were in a Women of OpenStack breakfast, and uh, Jessica Marillo, uh, a native Texan, told us that's, that's uh, the proper Texan uh, salutation. Um, so I'm uh, James St. Rossi. I'm a storage engineer for Comcast. I'm responsible for large-scale uh, Ceph clusters uh, that we run in Comcast. Um, and we use uh, block and object uh, out of Ceph for our OpenStack uh, deployments. And we have uh, quite a few of those. Yeah, I'm John Benton. I work, I'm a consulting systems engineer at WWT. I've been working with uh, Comcast and these guys for, uh, for a while, helping to tune Ceph and, and, and get things faster and, uh, and work on like, some new architectures and some uh, fun stuff like that. All right. So uh, today we're going to be talking about designing for high performance Ceph at scale. All right. So quickly, I'm just going to run through uh, today's agenda. So we're going to talk about uh, our lab and production environments, uh, holistic architecture looking at the whole picture and not just certain aspects of it, strategies for benchmarking, performance bottlenecks, lessons learned, uh, tuning tips and tricks. And so to start with uh, our environment, let's talk about our uh, typical node configuration. Uh, so we have uh, pretty large storage nodes. Um, these are uh, 72 drives, six terabytes, uh, SATA 7.2K. Um, so, you know, pretty commoditized drives, except that they're uh, pretty large at six terabytes. And then we have uh, three NVMe journals, PCIe uh, 1.6 terabytes, uh, two Intel, uh, 2.7 gigahertz, 12 core processors, um, or, well, processors with 12 cores apiece. And the cores are important. Um, in uh, Ceph, you've got a lot of parallel operations, so having more cores definitely helps. 256 gig of RAM. Um, if you follow the, the rule of thumb that you'll see on uh, Ceph's uh, website or on Red Hat's website, it would recommend more RAM, but we actually haven't had an issue with using uh, 256 versus like 512, which is a lot. Um, and then dual storage, uh, I'm sorry, dual port 40 gig NICs. Um, we don't really need that much bandwidth, bandwidth but um, you know, it's just to play it safe. Then we have the, the MON and the Rados gateway nodes. Uh, two processors, two gigahertz, uh, 32 gig of RAM, dual port, 10 gig NICs. Um, nothing special, like you just, it's really more about isolation for MONs and Rados gateways than it is about uh, having a lot of horsepower uh, to drive these things. All right, now this is a, a nice diagram of our, our lab environment. Yeah, so uh, so this, is, this is what we tried to do with the lab environment is, is make it as similar to the production environment as possible. Um, one of the really important things that, that we found was that uh, as we started growing these things out, uh, we started finding new problems that you just don't experience with one node or two nodes or three nodes or something really small like that. Uh, things like a network flow control, we started getting just tons and tons of packet drops, like up to like 10,000 a second, I, I think was one of the worst I, I had seen um, on, on any given node. Uh, like the mods actually started kind of become like, like I read on the Ceph site a long time ago that your mods are going to be a bottleneck. I'm like, ah, they, know, they don't know what they're talking about. They've never been a bottleneck. They actually started to become a bottleneck. Um, In very cool and interesting <laughs> ways. <laughs> exactly. Uh, also, one of, probably one of the most important things actually that, that we found as we started growing out these clusters is the, uh, the, the, the performance actually per node started to diminish as the cluster size grew. So that was actually, uh, that, that was a really key thing that we, that, that we found and we'll actually come, uh, we'll circle back around to that in a little bit. Uh, the clients are just sort of um, general purpose boxes. We wanted those to just kind of look like any ordinary client, uh, nothing too huge, nothing too small. Um, just so that it would be sort of an accurate representation of what you might find in the wild. Um, let's see, and then the, uh, yeah, so, so the general purpose nodes, we use them for toolboxes, for, for, for benchmarking, uh, all kinds of additional mods. We kind of went uh, up and down on the number of mods, up and down on the number of uh, Rados gateways that we were testing and, uh, and that kind of stuff. All right. so. Um we did kind of a cool thing. Um, we took, uh, we were lucky enough that we could take hardware we had for a production region 
and um, we were able before it got to us to actually put it into this lab. So we actually had a full scale lab um, to test with. Uh, so talking about our production environment, I can just say, there it is, um, which, is which is really, really nice to have um, that scale. Uh, some of the minor differences are um, in some of our regions, we actually have uh, two of these uh, side by side, so two 16 node uh, storage clusters. Um, and the reason for that is that we can directly uh, correlate the benchmarks and tests we ran in our production environment, um, well, in our test environment to our production environment. Um, also, uh, we have some clients that had really big asks in terms of IOPS and storage. And so this gave us a very um, trivial way of partitioning that so we could avoid the noisy neighbor syndrome. Um, sadly, we learned that one through experience. Um, I highly recommend don't learn that through experience. Um, and then the Rados gateways. So uh, we have a six per cluster, but we don't necessarily split it up three and three. We might split it up like four and two or something uh, different if, you know, it might be six on one if we really want uh, high performance uh, uh, object storage on uh, one cluster and no object storage on the other. So we can kind of uh, slide that dial uh, when we need to. All right, so now let's talk about our holistic architecture. Um, so one thing we've done is we've, we've tried to look at as much as we can, software, hardware, um, you know, the data center, uh, really, uh, just try and get it all in there because you really need it. it the, the, more, the more data you can collect, the more things you're looking at, the more tr uh, problems you're going to avoid uh, going forward. So first we have uh, customer requirements. So IOPS, you know, ask your customers, how many IOPS do you need? How much, uh, you know, what's your read-write mix? What's your object size? And then they're going to look at you and they're going to go, I have no idea. We haven't deployed yet. So what's it going to be? So, so then you need to coach them a bit. Right, so you ask them the, the simpler questions like, is it gonna be more read than write or write than read? So, so kind of slowly d start them down that path. Um, object size, so they, they'll say, you know, oh, our objects can be from 4K to 4 meg. And you know, so start to say, well, how about giving me an average? You know, is there an average object size? Because the more of this information you know, the easier your testing will be, and uh, the better you can architect the solution, right? If you know you have a very specific object size or you have very specific IOP requirements, you can engineer the solution for those and, uh, you know, instead of trying to engineer for everything, which is kind of, you know, you're never going to get a solution that's going to optimize for absolutely everything. And you'll wind up with something that isn't optimized for anything. Um, and then how much replication? You know, Seth is, by default is triple replica, um, which is a good default. But you know, you over say like two replicas, you do take you do take a hit in terms of storage, right? Triple replica means that you know you've got essentially one third of your actual uh, raw storage is available for usable. It's actually less than that when you take into account um, like uh, oh, the um, near full ratios and that that kind of stuff. Um, also, the more replication you have, you take a performance hit, right? Because it's copying all these bits all over your cluster. So, uh, you know, you're going to take that performance hit. In some cases, if you've got a customer that's like, yeah, we can rebuild all that data, you know, from, from our other systems. Like if it's a distribution or a CDN, like they've got sources and originals and they can just rebuild that. So maybe you can take them down to two replicas and give them more performance. See if they're uh, you know, if they want that kind of compromise. And then, you know, one of the uh, beauties of Ceph is its uh, uh, APIs, right? It supports, you know, you know, it's got object, it's got block, it's got CephFS, it's got iSCSI, it's got, it's got all these different things. Um, you know, do your customers need all of those, right? Because if you don't, if you don't need uh, object storage, you can get rid of the Rados gateways. You don't have to have these boxes for Rados gateways anymore. If you don't need CephFS, you don't need the metadata servers, uh, for example. Um, all right, so uh, keeping cost in mind, uh, a, lot of, a lot of engineers will just look at it from a purely like technical standpoint, but sometimes 
uh, or a lot of times cost is very much a component to your architecture, right? You know, you might be able to get more hardware and do more of a scale out if you're looking at the individual components and maybe keeping your, your scale up uh, constrained and then you can scale out more and you can get more performance that way. Um, so failure domains, ah, I didn't fix this. Um, so servers rack, servers row. <laughs> it's supposed to be servers racks and rows. Um, there's the failure domain for our slide presentation right there. Um, so, you know, do you want to fail on a per server, on a per rack, on a per row basis? There are costs involved in that in terms of, you know, you have to uh, step up your replication uh, and, and so forth and so on. So you have to keep the failure domains um, into, a, take them into account. Um, data center constraints. So uh, real quickly, talk to your data center architect. Know what he's capable of. What is your power budget? What's your thermal budget? Can you pull the unit out of the rack to access the drives from the top? Do you have a fiber network cable that'll snap when you pull it out on that cable management? These are all things, and this is part of the holistic architecture, keeping that in mind. Um, operational complexity. So uh, we, have a, we have a case where we had this one uh, chassis where to remove a drive, the sled had two drives on it because of the density of the system. So to remove one drive, you had to disconnect two. Well, that adds tremendously to your operational complexity. So um, you know, you've got this huge procedure because you actually have to take two OSDs offline even though you only want to change out one. Um, all right, and so to, to wrap up uh, holistic architecture, and any, um, no talk of Ceph is complete without mentioning the journals once. Um, you know, are you going to go with co-located journals, um, SSDs versus NVMEs? Uh, there, there are cases for, you know, to go either way and, and SSDs and every other way, and we could spend the rest of this presentation talking about the, the differences of that. Um, all right, so strategies for benchmarking. And so we, uh, whenever we started benchmarking, we, we decided to use FIO for block and uh, Cosbench for, for object. Um, the reason why is like they're, 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 they're good tools, they're publicly available, so you inherit a lot of things. Um, I can run it in one lab, another guy can get the exact same config file and hopefully reproduce the exact same results. So that was pretty handy, like we're sharing with uh, vendors like uh, Red Hat, um, you know, sharing it with Comcast and, 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 and all the back and forth. Um, it can be easily reproduced, like, oh, we're not seeing that, but we are. So you can kind of help narrow down problems. Um, one of the other things for benchmarking that's, that's really critical is uh, to analyze your production load uh, or get very, very good projections. Um, so whenever you're developing synthetic benchmarks, you just really want to make that look exactly like you, you possibly can. And, and, and really, on a storage system like Ceph, it can be a little unpredictable. Like you might be sending it like a 4 meg I.O. or whatever, but what's actually being seen at the disks is completely different. Like it might be 740K or something weird like that. So what you want to do is, is actually be aware of that. And whenever you design your synthetic benchmarks, make sure that they take that sort of behavior into account. Another thing is that you want to uh, do end-to-end uh, -end tests and also uh, test all of the individual components. Uh, by doing the individual components, you really get a good picture of like, are, are all of my systems balanced for my goals? Um, so, so you can find out, like, and, and you sort of find these weird things. Like for example, we found uh, whenever we were testing 40 gig NICs, we even saw one time where we were only getting like 12 or 13 gigabit. Like, why on earth is this happening? Uh, so we were able to just narrow that down really quickly, whereas if we were just running Ceph, uh, we, might, we may not have ever seen that. And, and then conversely, whenever you do an end-to-end -end test, you can kind of see how all these systems work together. We had to straighten the cables. The, uh, the ones get stuck going around the corners if you have too much of a bend in the Ethernet cable. We'll get more to actually why, what we did to solve that later. Uh, yeah, so the other thing that, that, that's, that's uh, pretty critical to do is, is to understand the various APIs that your customers would be using, uh, whether it's Rados Gateway, if, it, if it's uh, you know, LibRados, is it RGW or whatever, or um, RBD, I mean. Uh, the reason why is because each one of those uh, systems have sort of a, uh, they're sort of nuanced in how they actually show up to the storage. So, uh, so, so never sort of take for granted that like, oh, my stuff cluster, using FIO and RBD is going to behave the exact same way that RGW is going to do it, because they may be completely different. All right, so um, I just want to say IOPS isn't everything. 
And um, I have a certain customer that's probably vehemently disagreeing me with me right now. Uh, Chris Powers, I know you're out there somewhere. Um, so this this is so this is a pitfall we've we've gotten into a couple of times, um, and something I definitely have to always watch out for when I'm doing benchmarks. Um, you know, you'll have a certain number of IOPS, and you're like, man, if I increase the workers, I'm getting I'm still getting more and more performance, and then all of a sudden you're running a thousand workers, and you've got thirty percent more performance, and it's great. And then uh, you look at your latency and you're like, it takes five seconds to get one object through. That's, that's bad. So uh, always, always keep latency in mind when you're doing these tests and know that yes, you, know, you, can, you, you can fire, you, know, you can push a doorbell with a rocket launcher, but you know, it may not be the best strategy. So, so you have to back off the workers. That's something that I always uh, have to keep in mind and watch the latency. So, and uh, verify published stats with benchmarks. Um, this is very important, and you know I don't think you know anybody's you know fibbing on their stats or anything like that. But they have different uh, they have you know different situations or conditions that they're working under. They're definitely probably not going to use your exact workload. Always always verify those stats. Never take those um, you know as uh, you know as the, the the law that they you know could be. But always always verify them. Also verify there's the scale out if you can. I mean, obviously, um, you, you know, if you're deploying, you know, hundreds of, of nodes or something like that, it may be very hard to verify that. But really, really push. Um, it is not like if you get a certain number of IOPS out of a, you know, five five node uh, system, you're not going to get double that out of a 10, 10 node. So you really have to try and verify that as much as you can to to avoid uh, surprises in the future. And so one other thing, uh, whenever you're doing the, uh, the benchmarks, is you want to introduce some randomization. Um, well, one of the things that was really surprising to me is that uh, while we are actually doing some of the synthetic benchmarks, we actually found that, that doing some sort of like slightly off uh, block sizes, like for example, 250K objects versus 256K objects, actually caused some really weird performance benchmarks in some of the components, like these really, th like these really weird things, but they translated one-to-one -to, -one to the actual performance in the live cluster. So you actually always want to make sure that you're doing that. And uh, sort of along the same lines, you also want to make sure that you're always running like different scenarios. Like if you, uh, you don't ever want to just sort of like myopically become focused on a single workload, because what you might find is that if you're doing 100% writes, and 100% reads, and then just maybe one thing in between, you might find that like there might be some like really weird uh, nuance, uh, like at 90/10 or 80/20 or or something like that. So so it's a uh, uh, lesson learned from from James as you you sort of uh, go go through every last one of those and don't take anything for granted. Right, right. A lot of time spent there. Um, so TC Malik, uh, you guys uh, might have heard of this by now. Um, it, it's it, it's it's kind of going back to what I had uh, sort of hinted at earlier. Uh, as cluster size, uh, at, whenever we were testing these things in the lab, uh, as the cluster size increased, what we actually found is that the performance per node actually started like it started drastically dropping. And this was sort of going back to uh, you know what happens as you start scaling out these clusters that you might never actually see if you're only testing on like say three nodes and your production ones are going to be 12 or 400 or whatever. Uh, so so what we did uh, so we started looking into this and uh, what we noticed is that as the cluster size increased, the percent sys uh, CPU utilization was increasing disproportion disproportionately to the actual performance per node of these boxes. Um, and that's why scaling out your test, it, you know, can be so important. If we didn't, if we didn't scale out, we would have never seen this until we went into production. Exactly, and, and then been, uh, you know, wondering why things were running so slowly. Um, so the system profiling uh, using the utility perf top, if you know that one, um, it, it, it revealed that there was a bunch of uh, free and alloc functions from a library called TC malloc. Uh, they were consuming almost all of the resources. It, it turned out that they were like in complete deadlock all the time, uh, waiting for things to free so we could alloc, and then waiting for things to free so we could alloc, and it was, uh, it, it, that, that's what was causing that weird thing. So, so the graph uh, here is, is the per node performance before uh, tuning, uh, and what ended up happening whenever, uh, it turns out TC Malloc actually has, you can actually tune its uh, cache size with an environment variable. 
it's, it's like one of the coolest benchmarking things I've ever done where you can literally change one line in one file and get up to 50% performance increase out of your whole system. Right? If only it was always that easy. Um, we so, needed to five, like, find like five or 10 more of those and like done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Done. We, can, we can wrap up now, we can Our go home. 40 gig NUCs will actually be running at 80 gigs. It'll right. be wonderful. Right. Um, so uh, what, it, what it is, is it's actually, it's, it's a parameter called TC Malik Max Thread Cache Bytes. And it's set to a very conservative value, I think 16 megabytes. And you can dial that up to, I think it's 128 megabytes. And, uh, and what we actually saw is that like this, this whole performance deficit like that you see on the 19 node cluster where it's roughly 50% slower than it is on a six node cluster, um, that that becomes a lot more even. Not, not, com not in complete parity, but, but you're not suffering nearly as much of a performance hit. So, so, so doing that, it really has no downside. Um, Plan B is, uh, is using JE Malik. I, we did not actually test that, but it seems like that's actually like, that's really, really the fix in the future. Um, but we did not, we chose sort of not to test that because to use JE Malik, you would have to actually recompile Ceph and we sort of felt like that was too far off to reservation to be supportable in production. So, so we just kind of, uh, uh, we, we went with the environment variable fix. Um, and one other note in case you all go home and do that, if you haven't done it already, is that the uh, certain versions of the library, specifically like the uh, Ubuntu, the original 1404 release, like 1404 dot nothing, um, actually had a bug uh, it, that where it ignored that environment variable. So, so there's a C++ program out there that you can actually just sort of scrape, you know, it's a little one, you can just sort of screen scrape it, compile it and verify that you, it's actually uh, honoring that variable. So before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to discuss the modern PC architecture for the multi-socket systems. Um, there's a system called uh, uh, Quick Path Interconnect, QPI, that what it does is it enables bi-directional communication from the processes located on one CPU socket so that it can access resources, memory, PCIe devices, that kind of thing, located on another CPU socket. That's sort of the bus where all that happens. And it's sort of a point to point. Uh, so if you have even like a quad socket, it's still only going in one direction. Like it's uh, the, uh, let's see, where's the, where's the line here? Um, it's, it's called a uh, NUMA, if, mm -hmm. if you, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of that. Uh, the theoretical bandwidth on the uh, on, on modern systems is is uh, in aggregate 25 gigabytes per second, which is sort of uh, Intel's. It's actually about 12 and a half uh, in in either direction, but Intel okay. wanted to sort of boost those those numbers a little bit, so keep that in mind. And so you're thinking, well, I I'd never actually use 25 gigabytes a second, so so why why does that matter to me? It's it's way higher than we'll ever see. Um, yeah. And one other, uh, just one other note on that, uh, cores located on the same CPU socket will not go over QPI. This is literally for just socket to socket communication. Right. And when you're using the high density nodes that, that we are, well, you, you see the uh, QPI as a bottleneck at that point. So, uh, so quickly, uh, this, is, this is sort of a, a crude, uh, overly simpl simplified uh, workflow of, uh, of what happens like actually inside each of the Ceph nodes. You know, it's coming in the NIC, uh, it's going up and down the TCP stack, it's going to the OSD, the application layer, then it's going into the storage system, and, and you're talking about all the layers of, uh, you know, the, the kernel, the file system, you know, all the various buffers in between, um, all the various caches in between, all of, all of that stuff. Um, so, uh, so you can see that there's, uh, if you think about this, there's actually a lot of opportunities. Like if you have everything sort of sprayed out over the system, which is really the default behavior, um, you can see that there's a, a lot of opportunities for that same data to, to just continually to uh, hairpin back and forth uh, between sockets. So this is what our, uh, our nodes QPI bus looked like. That's about right. That's <laughs> I think yeah. that's a good approximation. It turns out, though, that actually the OSD workflow is actually more complicated than this. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever looked at the, the diagram of all the functions that get passed and, and, and back and forth, it's he, actually quite complicated. He started explaining it to me, and I was like, OK, I need, I need a little bit of a, a rest break and maybe an aspirin. <laughs> so, so we, um, the original architecture actually had uh, two NVMe cards. And uh, so we had an additional PCIe slot. And we thought, well, we'll just, uh, the, since performance is, is dictated almost completely by the journal performance in, in most cases, 
Um, we'll just pop in another NVMe card and life will be great. So we popped in another NVMe card and what we noticed is that instead of, uh, instead of getting like 50% more performance, it basically remained the same, but the individual NVMe cards were performing at the exact same level that they were before. So NUMA, our good buddy NUMA, uh, it, it turns out uh, that in, in Ceph, because of that sort of internode communication, you've got the journals, you've got the OSDs, you've got so many processes and so many threads and functions and, and all this stuff with that data potentially ping-ponging all over this box. Um, the larger the nodes and, and or the faster the nodes, if you're running an all SSD configure something like that, just the more data that you're moving in and out of these nodes, the more opportunities that you're actually gonna have for, uh, for, for crossing that QPI bus. Um, so, uh, so what we actually did is we, we uh, ended up tuning three areas uh, trying to optimize those, those trips. Um, I just, I put this in here kind of as a reference for everybody, but to uh, like the, really the, the pieces of information that you need to get. Uh, you need to uh, map which CPU cores live on which sockets. Um, they, depending on how many cores you have and sort of the architecture of your box, they can sort of be a little weird and how they're numbered like zero through 12 are on one socket and 13 or zero through 11, then 12 through 23 are on a different socket and they can just be kind of weird. So you need to map that out. You will spend a lot of time staring at the proc file system. Exactly. Looking, looking for that information and then proc interrupts will, will drive you nuts because it's got about like 80 columns or you're like, where is all this information? Yeah, I highly recommend uh, 4K monitors. They, they help <laughs> yeah, with that a lot. Yeah. Or dual monitors. I had dual <laughs> monitors and I was just like, okay, it's over there somewhere. Yeah, so you can actually get that information in proc CPU info. Um, the other thing that you want to do is you need to map where the PCI devices, what NUMA node they're actually located on. Uh, that's located in slash sys. Uh, it's a file called uh, NUMA node. It, it's a little um, hard to, to guess. I mean, it's obviously not impossible because that file system is auto-generated, but it's hard to guess as a human at what file it is. So what I actually do is just define a find slash this minus name NUMA node, and then I actually grep for the uh, PCI address that you can find in LSPCI. So just a little tip for you guys in case you're wondering where to find that. And it'll basically be uh, zero or one or w whatever the NUMA node is, uh, which corresponds to the socket that you found in CPU info earlier. Um, the other thing that you need to find out is you need to map the uh, OSD disks and the journals, if applicable, if you're not, if you're not co-locating, uh, to the associated HBA that they're actually living on, a RAID controller or whatever. So in our hardware configuration, we actually had three HBAs. So it was three HBAs and three journals, and of course two processors and one NIC. So it became kind of tricky. Uh, to do the mappings there. So the, the, the first place that we wanted to, uh, to optimize that is a soft uh, IRQs. Uh, what happens is the, uh, whenever data comes across onto a PCI device, it sends an IRQ to the, to the uh, an interrupt request to the uh, CPU, and, uh, and then the kernel uh, is actually, it spawns these things processes called uh, soft IRQs that, that in turn they pick that data up uh, off uh, whenever, the, whenever the IRQ comes in and says, I have data, these soft IRQs are able to sort of uh, balance that across all the CPUs by running um, uh, the, the soft IRQs. And they pick that up, they put it in a buffer, and then they mark it as uh, pending, and then that's when it starts moving up your application stack. So what you want to do, uh, the whole point of that, is that you need to uh, get the soft IRQs running on the CPU core where that interrupt is coming from. That saves you a trip across uh, the uh, QPI bus, one or more trips, uh, whenever you think about where those buffers are located and all that kind of stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, you wanna do this for all of your PCI devices, like you, uh, the network card, the eight, all the HBAs, um, and potentially if you have your journals in a different spot, like on an NVMe, you wanna get all of those soft interrupts pinned to the CPU um, socket where, where that's located. Um, the other thing you wanna do is you want to uh, enable one shot equals yes for IRQ balance D. Uh, different operating systems sort of handle that differently, like some operating systems, basically you put one shot equals yes and it promptly ignores you. Uh, so uh, what that does is that says, that, that tells IRQ balance, there's, there's tons of soft IRQs running. So you don't, uh, and the default behavior is to just assign them all to CPU zero. So you actually want 
the ones that you're not mucking with to actually get balanced. Uh, so, so that's what, what, what we did is, is we uh, did that one shot, yes, so that it would do it one time and then the IRQ balance mm -hmm. demon would, would, would go away. Uh, they don't really need to move in most cases. And then after that, what we did is we, we developed a script that, uh, that took all the data that we talked about uh, just a minute ago. And, and basically, uh, the way that you do that is you echo a CPU core or range um, or comma list or whatever. Uh, you, you can uh, echo that in a hex value into uh, proc uh, IRQ, then the IRQ number, which is really the PID, and then SMP affinity. So it's actually pretty easy in Linux to, to, to pin those guys. So watch, watch the range. Um, so in production, when we were uh, doing this, we actually wound up just pinning the individual core um, instead of doing a range because the, the logic behind the range was like, great, you've given me a range. Now I'm going to pick one. You know, so, so everything would go to the first, and so it kind of defeated the point because it would put everything on the first core versus actually distributing it throughout the core. Yeah, I suspect, so just be careful. I mean, that might be fixed, and it might be uh, different per, you know, Linux distribution. But just uh, have to verify that one. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's that's always the key thing to do is look in proc IRQ or proc interrupts and 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 just validate that what you think is happening is actually happening. Uh, the other place to look is in if you look at something like uh, MP stat uh, minus PL, um, then then you can see there's a percent soft column. And if you've always wondered what that is, it's how much CPU time is spent handling these soft interrupts. And if you see any single socket or, or CPU, I mean, uh, core handling a disproportionate amount, you probably need to go back in and, and look at that. So, so pin your NIC, your HBA, your NVMe, all to one CPU. And if you, you know, in our configuration, we actually had two HBAs and two NVMEs pinned to one CPU, and then to the other one, we had the remaining HBA and NVMe uh, pinned to the other with the NIC. So that's kind of how we balanced an unbalanced situation. So the next thing is the, uh, the NUMA uh, on the mount points. Um, fairly simple. What you, all that you want to do is you basically want to align the uh, OSD and the uh, journal if it is not co-located. Uh, you want to align those so that they're on the same NUMA node. What you want to avoid is like, a, like if you have a, a, an NVMe journal, journal on socket one and you have the, uh, the OSD is on HBA off of socket zero, you have a potential trip across QPI there. So, so that, that's really the situation that we're trying to avoid. So that, but that was pretty simple. Um, you can actually find that information in, uh, if you look in uh, uh, dev disk by path. Um, in that long sort of crazy string, actually has the, the uh, PCI address of the HBA that that disk is connected to. So, so just a little FYI. Um, this is really the, the whopper, I think. Uh, <laughs> This is where we saw the most performance, um, pinning the uh, OSD processes mm -hmm. yeah. so that the, uh, the core that it's actually, that that process is, being, is, is running on, it, it, it aligns with the uh, storage that it's actually controlling. Uh, that's really a huge one. Uh, and, and the reason why is just because that Ceph, uh, or the uh, OSD uh, process workflow is just so complicated, you have so many opportunities to bounce that back and forth. So it's much, much, much faster for you to go over L2, you know, like L1, 2, or 3 cache than it is to go over uh, QPI bus. Right, because with a, with a separate journal and a separate disk, you're going you're gonna to ping pong across the QPI bus three or four times if you don't have the OSD on the same uh, core or the C on the same socket as you do the the controller and the NVMe. Yeah, so the other thing that you want to be aware of um, what 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 can be sort of a potential like you make this change and you're like hey nothing changed. Uh, it, it it might be because if you actually just pin the process, which again is another uh, slash proc uh, PID number, and then I think it's uh, SMP affinity also is the same thing as the uh, uh, the IRQs. Um, Where's I going with that? <laughs> oh, is it the, the mask? Don't, don't use the mask, pin it? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you just need to make sure that the, um, that the, 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 the processes are, 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 are pinned uh, so that it's controlling the, uh, the storage where the, where, the, where the PCI devices are. That, that's really the key thing. Um, yeah, let's see. 
Yeah, one of the things that we did, like you can sort of spray them evenly, uh, or you can just give CPU ranges. The CPU um, or, or the Linux kernel will actually do a lot of auto balancing for you unless you pin them. Um, e either way seems to be ideal. Uh, it seems to be okay, but um, oh yeah. So so if what happens whenever the OSD processes start is they actually allocate memory for buffers and, and all that kind of thing. So you just need to make sure that they are, uh, uh, you, you pin them to the CPU when you start them. And the way that you can do that is by doing it in the init scripts. That actually saves uh, a situation where the uh, process starts on socket zero and it allocates memory on socket zero. And then you uh, switch the process over to socket one and then it's having to go to socket zero again every time it wants to talk to its buffer. So, so, that's, the, so that's the reason why you would want to do that at start time. And there are two, there are, I think there were two ways of doing that. There are two tools. There was, uh, task set and then NUMA CTL. So task set will pin the process, but it won't pin the memory, which I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. But if you use NUMA CTL, there's an option in it. Uh, it's like memory affinity or something like that, where it'll at least make a very good attempt to also pin the memory to make sure you're not like using the memory from the wrong socket now for your OSD that's pinned on the right socket. So definitely, um, I, would, I would advise you use NUMA CTL. Uh, as, as the tool in the init scripts. Yeah, it, it's a newer tool, and it does a lot of the same things that task set do, but I, I, I think that Red Hat uh, developed it, and they do have that memory migration feature um, if, you, um, if you use it, <laughs> which is not necessarily the default. Um, yeah, so, so doing these changes, uh, it, like they, they, they minimize latency in basically every situation, like, and, and really, the more you're bottlenecked by, by NUMA in the first place is going to be the more that you are uh, uh, going to benefit from, from, from aligning all of these things. All right, so just some, some general performance uh, tips. So, you know, these are just things that we kind of, um, you know, found were, were the best, uh, best cases or best, best things to do. So, of course, use the latest vendor drivers. There's, you know, there are two, Schools of thought, you know, be conservative. Uh, don't use the latest. Use the the, the most well tested ones. And we found um, that using the vendor drivers provided a 30% uh, performance improvement. Specifically, when we were talking about upgrading the the network and the HBA drivers uh, over the stock uh, built in uh, Linux ones, because the Linux ones can be very very old. What's what's actually been upstreamed? Um, then uh, we have uh, OS tuning. Um, Focusing on increased threads, file handles, et cetera. Um, this is important. So Ceph out of the box does not come tweaked. You, you definitely need to tweak it to get um, good performance out of it. Um, and also, uh, not only do you have to tweak the, the resources on the Ceph nodes, but if you're using this with an OpenStack configuration, something that recently happened to us was um, the U limits on the computes uh, weren't set high enough so that the Ceph client on the compute node um, was actually, what was it? When somebody would create over a two terabyte volume, it would fail because it ran out of uh, um, file handles um, or IO descriptors. Um, so yeah, definitely tweak the, uh, the keep, keep that stuff in mind. Um, so jumbo frames, use jumbo frames. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, right? You know, more payload, less headers. Uh, you know, you're going to be dealing with lots of data. It's a good idea. Uh, flow control. Um, so uh, we found this with the, the 40 gig NICs, um, and then we also found it with the 10 gig NICs, where we had these flow control issues that were only that we only saw when we were using ETH tool, um, and not if config. We would see uh, like like errors and dropped packets and stuff like that. Um, and it turned out to be the default setting on the switches um, was not uh, honoring the um, Ethernet Mac pause frames. Uh, and because of that, it was just dropping packets. It was very inefficient. We weren't getting the right uh, bandwidth out of these, uh, the net network cards. So definitely look at flow control in terms of these pause frames. Um, so uh, scan for failing. Um, so if a drive hasn't completely failed, there is a situation, we've seen it multiple times, where uh, the drive will still be responding, but it'll be responding very slow, like a sloth. And um, Ceph won't mark it as off, or it won't mark it out, 
yet, but you really should proactively scan looking for very high latency um, ION drives and take them out of your cluster. Otherwise, that can affect um, all of your cluster performance. All right. All right, here we are. Questions? We have one minute for questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely something we're considering. I think that uh, there, there are two cases, right? So if you're looking at kind of the bulk storage model where you just want to make it as cheap and, and you know, if, if you're worried about dollar per terabyte, you want to go with these huge notes, right? Because that's really going to economize on that. But I think for, for most workloads, simplifying it, um, we've seen uh, several solutions where they just went down to a single CPU and had you know the OSDs directly attached to it, and that definitely avoided that issue. Yeah. Do you guys have, do you guys have any <coughs> production? I mean, the goal source data on set. Goal source of your data on set, or the actual everything is on set. There is not a place. Oh um, now, I mean, the, we, we've got multiple uh, storage systems that we use. Um, you know, we do, we do do object and block there. We are, you know, now that CephFS is, is available, we're definitely going to be uh, turning that on. Um, I, just, I just talked to um, um, Sage and Neil today, and, you know, it's still, it's still brand new. You know, the wrapping's just off, so, so we're not going to, like, roll it out to all our customers immediately. But that is definitely one of the nice things about Ceph, um, and it's, I think, what diversifies it from other storage systems is that it really can do such a, you know, such a large spectrum of the different storage systems. But, you know, is it the perfect fit for everything? Mm, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, when you're talking about object, for instance, it's not going to be the most performant, right? So if you've got a customer that's only worried about IOPS, you might be, um, you know, advise to look and compare the performance to other, other you know, maybe purely object-based uh, systems. Or, well, ones that do Swift purely, maybe. So I have a question. You're okay. Ahead. So uh, you had mentioned that you used uh, jumble frames and the jumble frames really helped in the cluster network. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had experimented with jumble frame sizes. I mean, did you notice like a particular size that helped? Because uh, with 40 gigs, 9,000 bytes might not be enough. Right? Seems a little small, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough, uh, you know, cause, because 9K is the standard, right? And so uh, I know in our environments, all we really tested with at 9K and we had, because in production we're going through, uh, you know, we've got other networking groups that we're dealing with and that's the standard um, they're based on. So we really, we didn't really test past 9K. It's also one of those situations where it's sort of a two-edged sword where if you go too large, then you introduce latency. So, so 9,000 right. is kind of a nice compromise. And again, like it's, it's so widely supported. Uh, so that, that's really all that we tried. Right. On the hardware, one thing I'm curious about, uh, which was lacking from up there, do you go with a straight, dumb, pass-through HBA, or do you use oh, a yeah. array straight, with any sort of Don't like, bypass a RAID. Like, like get it out of there. This is software-defined storage. Um, reduce the complexity, don't waste the money on the battery backup or, or the memory. Like, you're better off spending that for your SD, SSDs or NVMEs. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I just saw another session that said the exact opposite, so I was kind of curious. Oh, oh, yeah. oh fight, so, yeah. fight. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I did a study on that, uh, actually, and, uh, and it turns out that there actually are some workloads where if you do like a bunch of one disk grade zeros, uh, it actually is faster, uh, but it's a it's very it's a very specific workload. Like just doing the pass through HBA is is faster in almost every other situation. And and the caveat of that is also when you're deploying to production, like dealing with having to set up the RAID controller and stuff like that, it's a real headache. Yeah, and you lose the ability. You sort of have to rely on the RAID controller's diagnostics. Like you yeah. lose all of the smart D uh, data. So so I. Right. Nine times out of ten, I, I would go with the, just a plain HBA. All right. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any learnings around erasure coding? Ooh, that's, that's a good one. That's, that's a hot topic. So we are very interested in erasure coding. We've uh, started testing it uh, for objects. Um, 
please um, you know, uh, call up your, your Red Hat rep and tell them that you really want erasure coding on block. I, I recommend go out and do that. They would love to hear that from all of you. Um, and I would love it too, because you know, I, I would like to use not a quarter of my raw storage, but 80% of my raw storage. That would be great. Thank you, sir. Yep. Can I raise both? <laughs> and I mean, the ca caveat, of course, is you take a bit of a performance hit when you're using erasure coding. Uh, but I would love to have that option. I would love to test it. I think there are definitely work cases. You know, if you're doing bulk storage, for instance, that's a perfect example where you know IAPs aren't the important thing there. And they explained to me that 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 performance hit is what makes doing block storage so complicated with erasure coding is because you're constantly doing read writes and that's that's not that's not great for erasure coding. I'm sorry, could you could you talk into the I didn't can, can you can you use sorry, sorry. I can't can hear you up here. So RBD with erasure coding is probably coming, targeted for the K release. So we are in track, on, on track of working on that. Great, great. I love it. I mean, uh, it's definitely something you know, that's, that's very exciting. It would, it would be nice to get a lot of that storage that we're all installing you know, to get more of it back and, and usable. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, the dollars per gig, is, it's, it's a hard case to beat. Right. So, so we'll okay. Okay, OK, last, last one. We got to go. <laughs> What class of disk drive are you using? Enterprise or sort of this cloud class? Enterprise. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank cool. you. Thanks. Thank you, guys.